Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, I've got five minutes and four points. Um, I'm mindful of some things that have been said so far in the conference. I noted Sylvia Matthews' comment yesterday about how agriculture, nutrition, uh, health nexus is complex. I also noted something in one of the parallel sessions today which said, is there a contradiction between this idea of scaling up something that's very complex? Um, my conclusion is that it's, it's, there's no inherent contradiction if scaling up is not simply replication and multiplication in a sort of cookie cutter way. If it's about adaptation and learning, then I see no potential conflict at all. I'm also mindful of Maggie Catley Carson's comments yesterday about uh, she used the language of transition and transformation. And, and again, I think that's what we're, we're trying to do uh, in this conference and, and beyond. So my, my four points are related to things that I think are scalable and things that are potentially transformational. So my first point is um, um, impact studies. There, are, there aren't enough of them. Um, the um, systematic review that uh, my colleague Eduardo Masset has been doing, uh, supported by DFID, on agricultural nutrition links looked at agriculture interventions that seek to have a nutrition impact. That's part of their explicit objective. Uh, 307 studies were, uh, were highlighted, uh, published since 1990. Of those 307 studies, only 30 of them had a sensible, uh, first cut, sensible impact assessment framework. 30 out of 307 uh, for nutrition. And nutrition broadly defined, not just uh, anthropometry. Of those 30, on a closer inspection, seven were thrown out because they weren't credible in terms of impact assessment, in terms of being able to construct a, uh, a credible counterfactual. Of those 23, 13 collected um, child anthropometry. The ones that didn't collect it, fine, um, but I just wanted to report on the ones that collected child anthropometry. Um, 13 of those did. One of them demonstrated a positive impact on stunting. Five demonstrated a positive impact on underweight. That's not the end of the story. Of the ones, we were surprised at the low, the low level of uh, positive impacts. So we went back and looked at the, uh, the studies that had no impact, and we concluded that half of those studies had, didn't have sufficient power in their experimental design to show an impact if there had been an impact there at all. So the bottom line of my first point is that we're pretty bad at doing impact studies in agriculture that seeks to have an impact on nutrition, and we need to do much better. Second point is, um, relates really to indicators. Um, is there an easy win by including nutrition indicators in, agri in evaluating agricultural programs? Um, if you go to the uh, SPEAR website on the CGIR website, um, we did an analysis of every impact evaluation, uh, quite a cursory analysis, but an, an analysis of every impact evaluation from 95 to 2008. So it may have changed in the last two years. 761 impact evaluations were cited on that site. Um, only 88 had any income, outcome indicators, so income, which is odd for a system that says it's about poverty reduction. Only 20 of those 761 had, he, had any nutritional health income, uh, and nutritional health indicators. Now, I think for, for, for agricultural interventions that have a purpose of reducing nutrition, and they don't, uh, re reducing malnutrition, and they don't all, but the ones that do, the donors and governments should insist on nutrition indicators and sensible impact evaluation uh, plans. Donors and governments and funders have a huge responsibility to do this, a huge responsibility to do this. And I don't really believe the argument that it's, it's really impossible to do this. It's not easy, it's difficult, there are long causal chains, there are lots of indirect effects. But I look back at the, some of the people in this room, Joachim von Braun, Eileen Kennedy, Pep and Strap Anderson, Howdy, Howdy Buis, they led these commercialization of agriculture studies in the mid 80s. Uh, and they traced the links through all the different causal chains that you saw in some of the parallel sessions to the impacts on nutrition, it can be done. We've just gotten a bit lazy about it. And if we don't do it, if we don't do it, I predict that the, the, the current wave we're on now, on the way up, we will have no friends when, when, the, when we're on the downward wave. Because we haven't shown, we haven't demonstrated the impact on human beings in terms of their, their wealth, in terms of their health and nutrition status. And I think that's so vital. You heard Michael Anderson talk about the, the donor appetite 
for um, impacts at the human level. Well, we must hold the donors to account to say, if you really care about it so much, uh, fund it. And then we have to also be held to account to actually deliver. So that's my second point, indicators. Third one is uh, sort of a perennial one, but uh, it's, it's uh, when you think about how do you intertwine agriculture, nutrition, and health, I think Pera mentioned it this morning, you have to focus on, you have to have a special focus, it seems to me, on women. You have to look at, because um, they're, they're the ones very often that are charged with these multiple agendas and then making them, making them work. Um, I'm, I saw a very interesting study from my old colleagues at IFPRI that was published last year, a systematic review looking at uh, differential access that men and women have to agricultural, a range of agricultural inputs. So, you know, we, at IFPRI, if we've been doing this for a long time, but this was, this was the most comprehensive, most up-to-date, best one I'd seen. 50 comparisons across uh, a number of developing countries. Um, of those 50 comparisons between men and women's access to various inputs, 25 of them showed no gender difference. That's important to note. 25 showed no gender difference. But when there was a difference, it was 98% against women. So what do you do about that? Um, we need to experiment, folks. We need to experiment with quotas, with gender quotas. We need to experiment with um, all, all female training programs. We need to experiment with farmer feedback, because many, many farmers are women. We need to experiment with farmer feedback mechanisms to evaluate whether interventions are working properly. And um, my final point is around training. Uh, again, Perrin mentioned this this morning. It's very difficult. I was, I was, before I came here, I spent a couple of hours trying to just find some studies that did some content analysis of training programs, masters, undergraduate, PhD programs, that have an explicit focus in bringing nutrition and agriculture together. And I couldn't find any. It was only two hours of searching. But maybe you know, you know about them and they're out there. But I couldn't find them. I found a study from Norway written by a colleague, Anna, Anna Osaug, which said it surveyed 90, uh, 90 employers in Norway and said, what, what attributes do you want from your nutritionists that you, you'd like to hire? The top attributes out of 50 attributes were an ability to work with people outside of nutrition, an ability to communicate uh, results effectively, and uh, an ability to communicate just in general. If we had, those, if we, we had programs that delivered those kinds of nutritionists, um, that would go a long way to helping us intertwine nutrition and agriculture. And I have to be mean to, to um, the US. I'm nearly finished here. I have to be mean to the US. I did find a study looking at uh, undergraduate training in the US in agriculture. And it found that um, only 5% of undergraduates trained in agriculture in the US um, passed, a, passed a pop quiz on international agriculture. So what that, what that tells you is that these things don't happen automatically. You have to train people to get out of their comfort zone, you have to have programs that begin to intertwine the DNA of nutrition, health, and agriculture right from the age of 18 or the age of 22. You can't, you can't expect this to happen without um, building, building that, that leadership and that expertise uh, very early on in life. Stuart, I'll stop there. Great.